this is Pez Down. Welcome to yet another edition. Here we talk to journalists about their journalism journeys, what they went through while processing, gathering, chasing the stories and getting them packaged for us to consume. Joining me today is a colleague who has worked in the media, mining and petroleum industries in Ghana and the Southern African region. She is a corporate communications and sustainable development practitioner who is currently responsible for the community relations department of Ghana's Petroleum Commission. Until her appointment, she worked as communications and media relations officer at the same institution where she helped to enhance the organization's brand visibility locally and abroad as far as its regulatory mandate and the promotion of Ghana's hydrocarbon potential is concerned. She has written extensively to shape the upstream petroleum regulator's image positively and maintained cordial media and stakeholder relations for the commission in the discharge of its mandate. As a broadcast journalist, she previously worked with Television Africa in Accra rising through the ranks to become deputy news editor. Prior to joining the Petroleum Commission, she worked with Anglo Gold Ashanti, AGA, where she helped change the face of the company's communication. She also facilitated government relations to build understanding on AGA global business planning. She was later seconded to AGA's corporate head office in Johannesburg, South Africa, as a senior communications specialist, where she provided specialist technical support and advice to continental Africa region management and mine sites on media monitoring and issues analysis, development of key messages, briefs, holding statements, and media releases. She is a product of the Ghana Institute of Journalism, where she had a bachelor's and diploma in public relations and journalism, respectively, and the University of Ghana, where she studied for her master's degree. She has attended a number of conferences and capacity building programs locally and abroad. She is a member of the Institute of Public Relations Ghana, and the Ghana Journalists Association. Nana Ekua Sechua Daku has joined me today for a conversation on her journalism journey. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pens Down, for having me today. <laughs> right. Uh, obviously, Finally, I'm on the seat. Exactly. Obviously, <laughs> TV Africa will miss you because uh, your rise means that you got to a certain position which was like the management or maybe middle management level and then you left how did they receive your resignation news <laughs> so it's so fresh in my mind um the day i resigned in tv africa just like any organization um, i gave um, a month's notice so on the very night evening when i attended in my resignation letter our HR at the time brought the letter to our news editor, um, Mr. A.C. Ohini, who is with them, multimedia mm. now. Yeah. And he asked, why are, you, why are you resigning? Why are you going to? Why are you resigning? Why are you going to? And I said, no, I'm not resigning now, but I'm just notifying the organization that in the next month, Mm. I will no longer work with TV Africa. And, you know, I mean, the usual from the, the usual worry on the face of a boss who That's thinks true. that, why would you want to resign? Mm. It was not later that I told them that um, they should calm down and that I'm moving for sense that um, I've got an employment with Andrew mm. Budashanti. Okay. And then the look on their face, you've got an employment with Andrew Budashanti. I said, yes. The reason why I'm leaving, and so I've changed that in my resignation letter. But 
per HR, oh. I have to notify the company for a month. So that's yes. how come I attended in my letter. So they took it with mixed feelings. Mm. I remember my resignation was communicated to our chief executive officer, mm. that is um, the filmmaker, Mr. Koansa, that yes. very evening before I left the premises of TV Africa for whom it was mm. communicated to him that Sichua says she's resigning. And he called that this is what I've been told. Why are you going to? I mean, like every equal opportunity employer would want to find yes. out where you are going to. Mm. And then I said that um, I've gotten an opportunity on Revo Shanti. So after one month, that is where I'll be going to. And he accepted it in good faith. Honestly, I must say that Mr. Ko Ansa, after the next morning, called me into his office and blessed yeah. me, gave him, he gave me his blessings. Yeah. Still on That's your what I exactly did. TV Africa working experience. All right. Which particular assignment sticks out for you? Maybe for the sheer extent to which it <laughs> challenged you to do the extraordinary. <laughs> or for the fact that it was the most difficult, or, mm. I mean, which assignment did you cover that you just can't forget? It remains so fresh because yeah. it took quite a lot out of you. Yeah. I don't think you want to know, but I'll share. I'll, mm. I'll share. So I remember vividly um, one fine morning I reported for work as a senior um, reporter mm. and typical of every new shoe, there was this book, big notebook mm. we were using. I know times have evolved, times have changed. And so it might no longer be that big notebook that we had in the new shoe. But mm. at the time that was what we had. And um, when I got to work in the morning and I asked my crew to check where or which assignment we've been placed on, they told me that it was various. And the story, but the story you are doing, you are looking at variously, um, you are um, analyzing other stories and other angles. And yeah. so the various was a look at the state of our cemeteries, or the look of, a look at the state of our cemeteries in Accra. That cemeteries. was my assignment. Cemeteries, yeah. <laughs> a look at our cemeteries, or a look at the state of our cemeteries in Accra. How did you receive that, that cemeteries? Uh, for a moment, it was like I wasn't thinking straight. <laughs> why Why cemetery? I, I, I just did not get a concept. Hmm. But so I went to the news editor and the news editor was um, Mr. Ofoyi Diogo was my okay. news editor. Hmm. So I, I, I went to him that, um, Mr. Diogo, I, I saw this assignment. I said, yes, yeah, D, you, you, you are going to the cemeteries today. Ah, okay. But I mean, I couldn't complain because mm. you're a reporter, you're That's sourcing right. for new stories. Mm. You source it from various sources. And tell you what, it was when I got to Awudomo Cemetery. You know, mm. if, if you are used to that lane at Awudomo mm. Cemetery, there are two graveyards over there. So yeah. the first one, is closed down. Mm. And that was where I got to know that when cemeteries are closed down, it takes a period of between 25, 50 to 100 years, following which new bodies can be buried. So the oh. first one was going through that process. Yeah. The first one was going through that process. And so we went to the second one. Oh, I saw open sorry. graves. I engaged with the cemetery attendants, they walked me through. I got to know that we have a um, Muslim cemetery, we mm. have a Christian cemetery, we have the military cemetery, and then we had a place for cremation. Okay. And it's, 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 you know, you see open graves, you see all sort of graves, ancient and modern, call it that. Mm. Hmm. And one thing that struck me when we go to the entrance of the cemetery, there's an inscription boldly written there that says that, remember, we were once like you before hmm. we came here. And it tells you one thing, that this world is a fleeting one. It is not our home. 
rather someday we we'll go back to our home where mm. we came from. Mm. And so what does it tell you? It told me at the time the need to be constantly humble and submissive. Although I've always been a humble and a submissive person, but doing that new story at the cemetery, we echoed the need for you to have a second look at life mm. and how you relate to people. Mm. It is not all about this world. There's mm. a lot on the other side. Yeah. And so just like the inscription there that reads that, remember we were once like you before we came here. Yeah. Anybody could go there at any point in time. Anybody That's could true. go there at any point in time. Yeah. So that alone tells you that, like I said, it's a fleeting world. Today we are here. Tomorrow we are there. So you are not set. Hmm. And so that story at the same about what life in its entirety is. Hmm. I, I, I learned a lot within that short period whilst on an assignment there, whilst hmm. covering the state of our cemeteries. And it didn't end there. From there, our next stop was the Usu Cemetery. Okay. Yeah. We walked in there. It's a very big, it covers a very wide area. Hmm. Probably when you are driving by, you just look at the end, but it goes deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. And at the tail end, it shares a wall with the state house and the parliament of Ghana. Oh. That is where they have the cremation bits. And so there's a cremation point there. Being cremated. Okay. I have never seen a body being cremated apart from watching it in movies. But that mm. day when I got to the cemetery, a body was being cremated and... I, I don't know whether to call it a rare opportunity or the opportunity to look at it, but I saw it with my eyes and I realized that, you know, this life is something else. Mm -hmm. So at that cemetery story was, was, was something big for me because wow. it was an eye opener. Let me take you to my question that would sure. have started this um, conversation. Who inspired Very. your choice of journalism Very. or what informed your decision to go into journalism? <laughs> I, I discovered myself at a very tender age. Okay. I had a passion for reading. I love to read. I love to read. I attended the um, British International School in Takradi. And I remember that in class four, yeah, class four, between class three and class four, we read the newspapers. Mm. Our teachers during the reading period will bring out copies, the Spectator newspaper, Mm. The mirror, yes, these papers. Mm. They will bring them out. And so we started with the paragraphs. We went to two paragraphs, three paragraphs. And so when it was reading session for us, there was the urge to read because everybody was reading. We're doing comprehension, mm. lady bird story books. That's right. We're reading. <clears throat> Those were the days that libraries were in good states. Mm -hmm. So we visited the libraries, we exchanged books. So the push was there. And so when I discovered myself, it didn't end there. Those were the weekends when your mother or father went to town and was returning home, will come with a copy of the mirror or the weekend spectator, mm -hmm. or even the daily graphic. But for us, the mirror and the, the spectator was the ish at the time. Okay. So you were happy that you had gotten that. So your father or mother reads you. You are happy that you are reading. Mm -hmm. And I also had that with my schoolmates or ask billboards or writings on vehicles that I saw. I made that attempt to read, to mm -hmm. mention the words, be it in the local dialect, be it in English language, be the names of 
shops, you know, typical of Ghana or typical of Ghanaian and Ghanaian um, passenger vehicles. They ride on, there's a lot of, they have a lot of rights. Yes. And when you're sitting in a commercial bus mm -hmm. yeah. or commercial taxi, the one behind you or the one in front of you or ahead mm -hmm. of you has a writing. That's so right. you definitely read. Yeah. So I, that also helped me a lot. And I, I listen to the news a lot. Okay. I listen to the news a lot. The seven o'clock news, I listen mm. to it. The major news bulletin on GBC at the time, I listen to it a lot. And you know, that they, those were the days of a social magazine and teen programs and children's programs and children's yeah. own and all these wonderful programs. So that made you learn along and picked a lot of things. Otherwise, mm. you couldn't have learned from the classroom. <laughs> now, a lot of journalists yes. in Ghana, <laughs> particularly, say that journalism yes. doesn't pay. On this platform, I have also spoken with journalists who are based outside Ghana. And okay. although they will not tell you it doesn't pay, they are convinced that you, the journalist, need to represent something to raise your value. Was it the same realization for you that journalism did not pay while you were uh, in active practice? Ooh. I, I, I beg to differ on this one. I want mm. to come on a different point of view. Very First well. of all, I went into journalism mm. with a strategy. Okay. The strategy for me was not to end up in the newsroom permanently. Okay. Or with any media house permanently. Mm. But the strategy for me was to find myself in there, upgrade, and move to the next step of communication studies. That okay. I'm not also saying. Mm -hmm. that it was an, a means to an end. I'm not saying that. Okay. All I'm trying to say is that communication studies is broad. It's a broader mm -hmm. area. That's right. It comes with a lot of disciplines. Yes. So you could be doing journalism. Mm -hmm. You could read law. Yes. You could move into sustainable development. Mm -hmm. You could move into it's, it's an advertising, it's, it's, it's a whole lot. Mm. Even in GIG at the time when I went in for my diploma studies or diploma in journalism, mm. we did psychology, we did mm. philosophy. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't limit you. There are a lot of disciplines to choose from. So like I'm saying, I went in there with a strategy. Okay. So I'll do, I'll practice journalism for X number of years. Mm. And then I'll move to the other side or the other field or any discipline in the communication space. Mm. And that's what I, 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 I did. So I entered in there, I upgraded myself, mm. and then eventually I found myself at the other side. But journalism made a big impact for me. Okay. It, it, it set the platform for me. Mm. You're always learning. Because you're always writing new stories that you are putting out there. It should be accurate. It should be concise. It should have great content. Mm -hmm. You should be accurate with your facts. If you are dealing with figures, if you are dealing with financial reporting, wherever or whichever discipline you are practicing, mm -hmm. you should have it at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. And so in journalism, you are always up to the beat. You're always ready to that's you right. know what is happening on every side of the economy. So if you're reporting from parliament, you should know what the sum of the standing orders are. You should mm. know procedures in the house. You should also know that, you know, you don't take phone calls at the press gallery. Mm. You cannot enter the chamber. You should, you should. So these are basic things that you should know. Mm. So like I'm saying, in journalism, whilst you are putting out information out there, whilst you are educating people, whilst you are informing, you are also learning. So it's a give and take affair. It's a two-way mm. process. That's right. So you, you, keep, it's, you keep learning by the day. You keep mm. learning by the day. 
So it's, it's, it's in a way made me also learn continuously. Mm. It, it was a continuous improvement for me. Mm. So if I had gone to the maternity block in Kolebu Teaching Hospital to do a story, I must mm. understand the dynamics. I must yeah. understand how it works. Mm. I can't just, you know, we are dealing a lot of people read the, new, read the newspapers. A lot of people watch TV. They listen to radio. They know more than you do. Mm. So you cannot put half-baked information out there. At a click of the button on Google, it all comes. Mm. So if, 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 even if you are going for an interview or you're going to interview someone, you should at least know your way around. Sure. You cannot just mount the microphone and scribble something or say something and think that you have it easy. No, mm. you should know what you are about. And so yes. journalism in itself, it is not about the practice, but it's an everyday learning process for you, the journalist or the individual. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, still at your, during your time on TV Africa, okay. you reported from parliament for some time. Yeah. What will stand out as the most memorable day or period? in parliament for you. The parliament is made up of a lot of drama most of the time, but what <laughs> incidents stand out for you as the most memorable or the, 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 the standout events for you during your time in parliament? Um, <laughs> 2000 and um, 2000 and 10 to, to 2011 to 2012, I think, or 13 when I resigned. Yeah. We had gone to parliament as usual and we are the press gallery. So at the press gallery, they are made up of two sections. Yeah. The TV, that is electronic media, TV and radio sit at one side. Okay. And the newspapers also sit at the opposite side of the mm. house. So we're there mm. one finally getting ready for proceedings of the house to start. Mm. So whilst we waited for the business of the day, someone beckons me that uh, an honorable member wants to see me. Mm. Who wants to see me? What have I done? You know. <laughs> an honorable member wants to see you. That early morning. What I've not conducted an interview. So, and the person at the time was um, the immediate speaker of Ghana's parliament, Honorable Michael Aaron Okwe. Oh, okay. Honorable Professor Michael, Michael Aaron Okwe. Aaron. Yes. Yeah, Professor Michael Okwe wanted to see me. Wow. Professor Michael Okwe wanted mm. to see me. I, I don't recall. No, uh, so on the spur of the moment, you have everything running through your mind. <laughs> so my cameraman then says that, oh, Professor Oke is coming to see you. Now Professor Oke is coming inside the gallery. That so made it serious. Um, then, then it means that it is. <laughs> I'll stop. I, 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 don't, I didn't know what my crime was. And to the best mm. of my knowledge, I hadn't faulted anyone. Mm. So my thinking was, I wait for Professor Kui. So he comes in. Young lady, how are you? I said, I'm fine, sir. I'm fine, honorable, I'm fine. I'm told you report for Television Africa, TV Africa. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I do report for TV Africa. So can you tell me which part of your journalism practice or the journalism school taught you that when somebody is making a submission on the floor of parliament, the cameras will have to pick an angle such as his back. And then I started wow. racing through my mind. What is this man talking about? And then he said, on the news last night, 
when I was making my submission, South Africa captured me from behind. Who taught you that angle should have been used for the news? So of all the angles and all the shots you took since morning, that was the best part you could use. I, I apologized. I, I had to apologize and I did. And he, she, he told me that, look, when somebody's making a submission on the floor of the house, the person is talking to a lot of people out there, his constituents, his mm. or her constituents, the entire mother Ghana and even beyond Ghana, the shores of Ghana. Mm. So the person should even have an eye contact with the camera. But if you capture behind or you pick an angle from his behind, whom is he or she communicating to? Yeah. And I knew I had Ed. It shouldn't have been done in the first place. So I acknowledge the fact and I thank him. I thank him for prompting me. It taught me through things that when mm. next I go to the editing bench, mm. I must sit through and ensure that videos edited are edited to the latter. That's right. Because if you leave it for the editing guys or the video editors to conclude a story for you, they were not there. They can't put mm. any shots in there for you. But mm. you, because you were there, you understand the dynamics and you know what should be put there. So it means I didn't follow through, which mm. I should have. So I had to accept it. Mm. So you see, it's a learning process. <laughs> it's a learning process. And it was a, it was a learning curve for me. Mm. It was. So in journalism, you always, it is never a dull moment. Mm. It's, you always learn. You always, you, you, you always, you always learn. Mm. To that when I'm sitting at home or wherever I find myself and I'm listening to the radio, I'm watching TV, and there's a technical hitch. I can understand where it's coming from. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we should take you back into time to your teen age days, yeah, and you have to make a choice for a profession, will journalism mm. still be on the table? Uh, I will do it again and again <laughs> and again. I will do journalism. I'll practice mm. it again mm. and again and again. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Wow. 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 Ask me why will I do it again and yeah, again. Yeah, go ahead. Again. Go ahead. Uh, because, like I mentioned earlier in my earlier submissions, I constantly say that journalism makes you to learn. It pushes you out of your comfort zone. It's an everyday learning experience. It helps you make informed decisions. You're always reading, you're always writing. And so when policies are initiated, when there are social intervention programs, you have a, a better appreciation about it. You know about it to the wider public. Mm. You sit in a country, and because of the practice of journalism, you, every sector of the economy, you are pressed mm. with it. Mm. You understand. Talk about aviation, mm. talk about finance, talk mm. about health, talk about um, the informal sector. Mm. You, you, you know it. Because don't forget, once you are writing, once you are speaking, once you are talking about it, once you are interviewing other people, two way of communication, the giver and then the receiver. And so whilst you are busily interviewing people and they are sharing their knowledge and ideas, you're also picking from there and you're also learning to enrich yourself. Mm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a two way process, it's a given and then it's a take. So, it is, it is a function of a career that makes you learn each and every passing day. You mm. cannot go wrong with journalism. Mm. It, journalism gives you that solid foundation to perform everywhere. Mm. And so you realize that at the end of the day, you are an all-round performer. Mm. So let me use myself as an example. Okay. I use myself as an, as an example because... After TV Africa, 
Mm-hmm. I left for Anglo Buddha Shanti mm. as a communications person. Mm. It was easy for me. I dealt with press releases in the new issue. So I knew, apart from learning in the classroom, the various type of press releases, in the new issue, I wrote the releases because they do not, you don't present it the same way as they brought it. Mm. You tweak it around. Yeah. So I knew about that. So I went into communications from a TV background or from a communications background to communication on the mind. And it was, I was used to the skills and the rudiment of communication. So I had it on my fingertips. So I was yeah. able to settle in quickly. Yeah. So it, it prepares you, it, it, it prepares you and gives you that solid foundation. I went to TV Africa as a raw material. Thankfully, mm. I left there as a processed good. Mm. I went in as a raw material yeah. and I left not in that raw state, but this time I left processed already. Mm. So that is what journalism does. Is there any particular public figure that you would have wished to interview while you were practicing, but you never got the opportunity? (laughs) That was Madiba. Okay. Okay. Nelson Mandela. Unfortunately, he's late now. Yes. Mm. The late... Nelson Mandela, president of South Africa and a mm. freedom fighter, mm. was the person I would have wished to interview. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Also for the values that he stood for, for his mm. selfless personality and what he stood for as an mm. iconic African figure. In the Southern African region, I had the opportunity to interview the late Morgan Changarai. Okay. Yes. And they had um, come for a mediation pro. Yes, it was, it was at the time. Morgan Changarai was come. the Zimbabwean opposition leader, am I right? Yes. So in the Southern African region, okay. he was had a chance mm-hmm. to interview. Professor Atham Zambara, he okay. was um, also, I think he was an opposition leader in Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they did a power sharing. That's right. One great African leader, mm-hmm. and also for him, the values he stood for. Mm-hmm. Most of his um, speeches, most of his talks, most of the seminars, most of the programs I attended, even. Um, when I had a chance or the opportunity of interviewing him at the Zimbabwe Expo, I attended an expo in Zimbabwe and then we met and we did an interview. He still didn't understand why as Africans and as blessed as we are, we always were taking our begging baskets around. Mm. We had all the rich resources. And so why would we always take that begging basket around? And so he was also of the view that his colleagues, African leaders were too faced. And so they came begging for votes Mm. with two hands. When they are voted in power or into power and they now have power in their hands, Mm. One hand goes back behind them and it is the other hand that they are using. So you you never do, you cannot tell what is happening to Africans. Yeah. Is our failure systematic? Mm. Mm. So these are African leaders that I interviewed and I learned a lot about them. Mm. Is there any single incident or is there Mm. anything, your blueprint, your career blueprint aside, is there anything that can bring you back to journalism? Anything? Yes. 
I, I wouldn't be surprised if I find myself reading the news, hosting a program. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I wouldn't surprise myself. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I won't. <laughs> I, uh, I I I won't surprise myself. I will I not think, also be surprised. I think it's possible for TV Africa. If you have to come back, and uh, Mr. Kowansa, the great, happens to see you on another platform, doing a show or hosting a program or something, he might give you a call and find out. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean now it is over between us. He will want you to say that. <laughs> I I I am indebted to Mr. Kwanza. Mm. He pushed me. He pushed me out of my comfort zone. This is someone who took great interest in his employees. Mm. He woke up early in the morning to observe what we were doing. He watched the news. Oh. I was on the daybreak morning show. And so at the time, as early as 4 a.m., I've left home because I have to go and prepare for the morning bulletin. That was our morning show, was a daybreak show. And the mm. first bulletin of the station was a daybreak news. And so I had mm. to be there to read the news. Oh. Mr. Ansa watches the news. When he gets back, he gets to the office. He calls you and tells you that if you, you don't know a word, you ask rather than to go and sit on air and then fumble. It is mm. better to ask. Yeah. If you don't know, you ask. He taught us that. And so it was a crime at TV Africa place, city, animal, or a thing. Because there are a lot of people around the nation. So if you don't have, if you don't know, you ask. Mm. He pushed everybody. He gave everybody the opportunity. So far as you were prepared to learn. And don't forget that in GV Africa, apart from English, Akan mm. was a major language. Okay. So apart from English, we're doing, we're broadcasting in Akan. Mm -hmm. We're broadcasting in um, uh, Ever. Mm -hmm. We're broadcasting in Dagomba. We're broadcasting in Hausa. Mm. So we're doing four or five major Ghanaian languages. Why were we doing that? We're doing that because the vision of TV Africa was to project African values. African values. We are telling our story. We're telling it the African way. And so we are saying that we will not sit back for someone to tell our story for us. We're telling the African way. And so if you are an employee of TV Africa and you are aligned to the vision, you, you follow suit. Mm. I wear my beautiful African print here. Mm. Afrocentric. So it's Afrocentric. Mm. It's too, it is TV Africa that I picked all that from. Mm. Because Africa is endowed. We have beautiful African prints. Yeah. And we needed to bring life into the prints. Mm. Mm. And so... On, on, on TV, when you're beautifully sewn GTP clock or any other, Af any other African print, we tied out, we had a, if you, if you are not in a head GA, you had braided your hair. Everything we did in TV Africa was in moderation, makeup, mm. everything was in moderation. Our forms of communication, we depicted, you know, even before the montage role for the news, it was a drum. Mm, a drum yes. and a gong gong bita. A gong gong bita That's was right. beating yeah. the gong gong. Yeah. In the olden days, when the community needed to have an information to, it was a gong gong bita that went to the community to be the wanted to pass on information. That's right. That was the way of communicating. So we mm. used most of these tools to communicate. Programs that we were running on TV Africa had Africanism in it. Mm. So at the time I understood my environment, I understood what the station I'm working for 
stood for, the vision. Mm. This has been exciting. Yes, it has. I think, <laughs> it I think really uh, has. on the day you will go uh, and teach, this is your pro bono teaching. I may have to stop smuggle myself into your class. <laughs> to take a thought or two. It's... <laughs> I, I, I will. And mm. guess which institution I want to go back to? Where? So I want to go and give back to GIG. That would be great. That is yeah. individual social responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to give out to the school that made me and many others out there. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. This has been passed down. Journalism journeys. That's what we talk here. <laughs> And today I've had uh, one of my colleagues, never a dull moment with her. The ideas, the submissions, and you know, the propositions, the suggestions, always <laughs> ever <evaluate. laughs> Nana Ekia Sechiwa Daku. She is a TV African child, so she has no uh, made in abroad name, purely no. African, purely Ghanaian name. She's been my guest today. Um, first <laughs> Yes. Before we, we call up the curtain on today's sure. session, mm -hmm. I'd like to say a big thank you to God Almighty for bringing me this far. Mm. And for those who held my hands, helped me crawl, walk, and have seen me through. I'm always grateful and thankful to Mr. Kwan Sam for giving you the platform. To all the news editors I worked with, the late Mr. Nkrumah, Mr. Ofoi Diogo, Mr. Fetchidi, AC Ohine, the late Nanai Awudidi, otherwise known as Josephine Mensah, who was my news editor, TV Africa, who practically ensured that I went back to school for my first degree wow. and to progress in the issue. To my family for the constant family support. Without them, I'm not sure that I could have gotten to where I am. Mm -hmm. Family support is important. I had yes. that a lot. Yeah. And to someone who was insistent that if I had not gotten admission at GIG, I should keep trying. And who also ensured that and saw me through and supported me through my days at GIJ, mm -hmm. be it a diploma in the degree level, in the person of Anrabu Jubidwansa, one time MP for Efia Kwesintim constituency in Takrati, yeah. has contributed immensely yeah. to my life. Yeah. And everybody out there, yeah. and so today I'm using Pence Downs platform to tell all of them that I appreciate it so much. Occasionally, when I meet them, I express my gratitude. But today, I want the world to know that it had not only been by my efforts, but I had people who helped me, mm. who groomed me, who helped shape me. And I was open to criticisms. I accepted whenever I went wrong. Mm. I loved the constructive criticism because it kept me going. And so I am grateful to all of them for their time, for their money, for their support, for the encouragement, the mentorship, the tutelage. It's helped me. And so I'm wow. grateful to all of them. Wow. Wow. And for to God Almighty for that strength, the pillar of strength. It's been a difficult moment. It's not been a smooth journey, I must say. Mm. I fought battles, I've weathered the storms, but it's been grace. Oh. All the news editors, all the news coordinators, the likes of Jifan Kansa, now Jifa Afeni, Sir Koka Kutcher of GTV, all of them, I worked with them. In fact, Jifa Afeni and Sir Koka Kutcher, I worked directly under them at TV Africa as a greenhorn. Mm. right from GIG when I went in there as my national service. They taught me how to split the news bulletin. Mm. I'm grateful to all of them and for the potential they saw in me. Jifan Kansa taught me how to do voiceovers mm. and script writing. So I'm, 
Time wouldn't allow me to okay. mention all their names. I'm That's just right. grateful to all of them. And all I can say is that may the good Lord in his infinite mercies bless all of them and grant them their hard desires. But as they have taught me, I'll also continue impacting. I will not mm. break the chain. I'll also continue to impact to others so that the world becomes a better place for us all. Thank you. The world will definitely become a better place for us yeah. all. Pens down. We talk journalism, James. Nana Ekuya Sechiwa has been my guest. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back next time with another journalist on the seat talking to us about their journalism journey. This has been personal. Thank you for being with us.